Praise the Lord, everyone. Good morning and bless the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we are going to rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, I hope you're ready. I hope you're ready. Uh, I hope you're ready to praise the Lord. I hope you're ready to clap your hands. I hope you're ready to shout. I hope you're ready to rejoice. I hope you're ready to give God the kind of praise that only our God deserves. It's a beautiful day. Somebody say, this is the day that the Lord has made. And we are going to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. It's a beautiful day. And we thank the Lord for another privilege and another opportunity. Amen. To be able to come into your homes this morning and to share with you um, the word of the Lord in Jesus' name. Uh, God has been good to all of us. Amen. If you can hear me, God's been good. Amen. Amen. If you can hear me tell somebody, God been good. God been good. Amen. He's been good to us in Jesus' name. We find ourselves in the land of the living. And in spite of what we're dealing with, in spite of what's going on, and so in spite of what we're surrounded with, God still deserves praise. He still deserves glory. He still deserves honor in Jesus' name. So we bless the Lord this morning. We bless him in Jesus' name. And I, I pray that everything is well with you and your family. We've been praying for you guys. I pray, amen, that you've uh, gotten strengthened from the Lord. I pray that you encourage from the Lord in Jesus' name. And uh, I pray also, if, if nobody's been there to encourage you, uh, uh, you got to do like David. Sometimes you got to encourage yourself in the Lord. Amen. And so I pray that uh, you're encouraged in Jesus' name. Uh, this morning, amen, before we uh, go too far, I want to uh, start out with a word of prayer in Jesus' name. And, and we're going to be believing God this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. So we want to pray. So gather those that are in the house with you. Gather those in Jesus' name that are there with you. Amen. And we're going to touch and agree and we're going to pray this morning. In Jesus' name, for God to touch and for God to move and for God to bless. And we understand and recognize uh, that there is a lot to pray for. Uh, there is a lot to pray for. And we just need to develop a praying spirit. The Bible declares uh, that uh, men ought to always pray and not to faint. And so what we need to recognize and understand that it is time for us to pray. God is calling us into prayer in Jesus' name. So get your family, get your husband, get your wife, get your children, get the dog, amen. cut the TV off, amen, cut all of that off, and we're going to go before the Lord in a brief word of prayer. And, we're, and remember this morning, we want to pray for all of those ones, uh, loved ones that have lost loved ones. We want to pray for all of the people that are bereaving right now, that haven't been able to bury their loved ones and give them a proper uh, respect uh, that they deserve. Uh, we're going to be praying for those that are in the hospital rooms right now. We're going to be speaking healing in Jesus' name, that they recover, amen, that they get up and that, amen, they come home and that they give God praise. We're going to be praying for all of the nurses and all of the, the doctors and the first responders and those that's on the front line. We're praying also uh, for the people who sometimes we esteem very lowly, but right now they're keeping us going. We're praying for those clerks at the grocery store. We're praying for those that push the buggies in. We're, we're praying for those that stock the shelves in Jesus' name. We're praying for all of them that the Lord would just bless them and that the Lord would just touch them in Jesus' name. And more also importantly, we have to pray for our leaders, for our world leaders, for our president, for kings, for uh, prime ministers, for those in authority, for those that are making decisions. And we pray for the nations right now. We pray in Jesus' name for all of the countries that are dealing with this pandemic. We pray that God would be with them in Jesus' name. So if you would, amen, amen, amen. Clear your heart, clear your mind, clear your spirit in Jesus' name. We're going to go before the Lord with the word of prayer. And so right now, stretch out your hand. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we come before you this morning, God, we simply say thank you. We say thank you for being so good, for being so gracious, for being so merciful, for being so kind, and for being so loving, God. We thank you this morning that we are yet found in the land of the living, oh God. We thank you, as the old people used to say, for a reasonable portion of our health and a reasonable portion of our strength, oh God. And we just thank you this morning that we're found in the place of worship right now. 
So God, right now, as we come before you, we acknowledge your goodness. We acknowledge your grace. We acknowledge your mercy. We acknowledge your sovereignty, oh God. And God, even now, we submit ourselves unto your sovereignty. And this morning, as we come, we lift up all of these circumstances and all, God, of these situations, God, that you already know about. So, Father, we just ask you in Jesus' name to minister according, God, right now to the need. You know those that need strength and grace and help that are dealing with bereavement, God. You, you know those that are crying because they've lost loved ones, oh God. And we pray, God, now in Jesus' name that they would feel the loving comfort of your spirit and the loving comfort of your caress, oh God. Do it in the name of Jesus. And Lord, right now, we lift up those that are struggling for life. We speak life over them now. We speak breath over them now. We say live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. Father, now, in the name of Jesus, we believe you that it's done. We believe you that it's worked out. We believe you that they're recuperating. We believe you, God, now that they're being healed, God. We believe you that they're being restored, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And Father, we ask you right now for every doctor, for every nurse, God, for, for the ones that are overwhelmed, for the ones that are tired and the ones that are at their wits end. We ask you for strength. That only can come from you, God, according to your word, that in our weaknesses that your strength is made perfect, oh God. So we ask you to do it now in the name of Jesus. And God, we just declare today in Jesus' name that you and you alone are worthy of praise. We declare right now that you alone are worthy of glory. And so, God, we lift up our president. We lift up the kings. We lift up those that are in authority. We lift up the prime ministers. We lift up the rulers. We even lift up the dictators that are dealing, God, with this pandemic. We believe you, God, in Jesus' name for your glory to be revealed. And we understand that you will get glory out of this, God. Hallelujah. We thank you this morning. We bless you this morning. And so now we invite you to come in. We invite you to fill this space. We invite you to suspend the time. Let time not even be relevant right now. Allow your glory to come in, Father. Because when we get on your time, God, nothing else matters, God. So this morning, God, hallelujah, we declare victory, we declare strength, we declare glory, we declare power, God. We declare it in the name of Jesus. We speak life, oh God, to anyone that hears me, to anyone that sees me, God, now that your glory would be revealed in them. And God, right now, in Jesus, set the atmosphere for a move, set the atmosphere, ah, God, for your glory to come in, set the atmosphere for your presence, yeah, God, yeah, God, for your presence, hallelujah, to be made now. Manifest God. Hallelujah. And we'll give you the praise that you so deserve. We'll give you the glory that you so deserve. We'll give you the honor that you so deserve. And touch those today, God, that are homeless, those that are less fortunate, those that are trying to figure out how to make it work. Bless them even now, God. Do it in the name of Jesus. Have your way, God. Have your way. We'll give you total praise. We'll give you total glory. We'll give you total honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Somebody give God a prayer. You pray. Amen. So bless him like he heard you. Hallelujah. Come on. You pray. Give him glory like he heard you. Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. Don't wait till you see it. Go ahead and give God a praise right now. Go ahead and give God some glory right now. Go ahead and thank God right now because he is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. And I, I, I feel in my soul, yes, God, hallelujah, that the best is yet to come. Hallelujah. I feel, amen, that God is going to do a new thing in some of us. Oh, my God, I wish I could give somebody a high five and say new thing. Amen. Remember not the former things of old. Amen. Don't even consider them. God says, I'm going to do a new thing. I'm going to make rivers in the middle of the desert. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The beast of the field is going to glorify me. Hallelujah. So we thank God this morning. We bless him. We bless him. We bless him. We bless him in Jesus' name. And so, amen, I would like to take this time to welcome you in Jesus' name into the sanctuary. I would like to take the time to welcome uh, uh, you into my space. And at the, at the same token, amen, I would like to say thank you for welcoming us into your space in Jesus' name because I recognize and realize that there are a myriad of, of things that you could be doing 
right now, there are a myriad of churches and streaming and online things that you can be checking out right now. But we thank God that you thought about us and you considered, amen, to allow us into your space in Jesus' name. And I'm very grateful and I'm very honored and I'm very humbled to welcome you into this space in Jesus' name. And I don't know about you, I stand in a good space. Amen. I stand in a good space because God is in this space in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God is in this space. Come on, somebody just give him praise and invite God into your space. Invite God to come in. And come on, somebody give him praise and invite God, hallelujah, to minister to you right now. Prepare yourself. Amen. Amen. For the word of the Lord in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. We bless the Lord. I want to give a shout out. We certainly thank the Lord for uh, First Lady Bell in Jesus' name. And uh, we thank God because Sister Bell, First Lady Bell, has become a, a multitude of people behind the scenes in Jesus' name. So she's our production manager. She's our camera person. She's all of that. Amen. So we thank the Lord for in Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name. And let's give the Lord a praise because she's doing an awesome job in Jesus' name. All right, all right. Get your Bibles, amen, uh, because men should not live by bread alone, amen. And you ought to have your Bible. You you ought to be able to find your Bible. Your Bible shouldn't be lost in a time like this. You you ought to know where it's at. Matter of fact, you should have several Bibles just around the house in Jesus' name. And grab your Bible, whether it be digital or whether it be physical or, or you know, that 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 Easter Bible that doesn't pass down through the generations that sit on the table. Get that Bible, dust it off. Amen. And we are going to look at the Word of God this morning. And I want to tell you, I want to tell you this morning that God has dropped a, a message in my heart. And it's something that I've been ruminating on for quite some time. And the Lord has allowed me release this morning to minister to you. So this morning, I want to tell you right now, you, you need to put your seatbelt on because uh, it's going to possibly challenge uh, how you think. It's going to possibly make you reconsider what you thought. And so this morning in Jesus' name, we, we bless the Lord. Amen. You have your Bibles. You're ready. We're going to go into the Word of God now. And we are going to be looking at John chapter number two, and we're going to consider verses 13 through 16. John chapter two, verse 13 through 16. And um, it reads as thus, Verse 13 says in John of chapter 2, and the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Verse 14, and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves. And the changers of money sitting. Verse 15. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers money and overthrew the tables. 16, and said unto them that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. And I want to minister a message to you this morning entitled, The Other Side of God. Oh, somebody give God praise, give God praise. We want to talk to you about the other side of God. 
I feel like God has put me on a mandate to deliver this word, the other side of God, because I recognize and realize that until we can develop a panoramic perspective of the being and the person of who God is, we do ourselves an injustice. The reason I say that is because based upon how I see God, it also impacts what I expect from God. And oftentimes when I can't see God in his fullness, my expectation of him is limited to the parameters of my thoughts. This message may be a little theological, but I want somebody to see God in the fullness of who he really is and what he really does. So this story that's found in John chapter 2, it is a unique setting because it's also the setting where Jesus performs his first miracle, where you know the story how they run out of wine and they come to Jesus and Jesus turns water into wine. And, and, and the host, or they tell the host that you've saved the best for last. And I cannot tell somebody that God is getting ready to do some of the best things he's ever done in your life in these next few days. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But then uh, as, as the chapter unfolds, we find Jesus going to the temple and the Passover was at hand. So he's going up to Jerusalem to get ready to celebrate the Passover. And what we see in these unfolding scriptures is contrary to what we've been taught and contrary to what we thought because we see a different facet of Jesus. We, we see his righteous indignation which is we see his anger become kindled but it's kindled out of the seeding of his righteousness. And it's contrary and it's hard for us to, to grasp this and to read this and to, and, and to hold on to it because it's contrary to what we've been taught. We've been taught about the, the love of God and we've been taught about the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God, the, the grace of God that brings salvation, tells us that it's appeared unto all men and it teaches us. We've been taught that a bruised reed shall he not break and a smoking flat will he not quench. So we understand that there is textures to his tenderness and that there is layers to his compassion and we recognize and we understand that we can bring our little ones to him because he's tender and he wants to be able to minister to even the children but this is creates tension and it creates tension because in this chapter, what I, what I see 
is a different facet of who he is. Somebody clap your hands and tell God thank you. <clears throat> Come on, tell him thank you. It's a different facet of who the Lord is and who he's been presented as. And so don't make no mistake. When he goes into the temple and he sees them that are selling oxen and sheep and, and doves and changing of money, just to bring it up to our time and day, he grabs a hold to a belt and he begins to whoop them and he begins to flip the tables over and he, he, he starts to run off the sacrifices, the sheep and the, the lambs and the, the doves. And uh, uh, he begins to clear out the temple. And, 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 it, and it's, it's a challenge in our minds because this is contrary to what we thought about him. And even, uh, I've said this when we were in the sanctuary before, Sometimes I wish I could take my belt off and, and potentially run some folks up out the sanctuary. <laughs> and I can hear somebody saying, you ain't Jesus, Pastor. Yeah, I know. I know. Love you too, in Jesus' name. But the truth of the matter is, this begins to make me think about Christ on another level. And if you're going to develop uh, a clearer understanding and a clearer perspective of who God is. You've got to see him in the many facets that he possesses. Because I, I use the word facets because let, let's look at a diamond for a second. When you look at a diamond, what brings the brilliance of the diamond to the forefront is that it is not one dimensional. Uh, the, what makes it sparkle, what makes it have its radiance and its effulgence is that it is facets to it. Those are uh, the flat lines uh, that have different angles to them. So depending on the movement and depending on how the light hits it, the facets help its refraction rate. In other words, how it reflects and shows light. And the more uh, you move a diamond, uh, the more facets you see. And uh, the more beautiful it becomes to you because you're seeing it from the different angles that it possesses. And make no mistake, make no mistake, the reason that I'm bringing this message out today, the reason that I'm speaking this to somebody is because if we limit God to the one facet of our perception of him, we cannot understand him when he moves in a different light. We cannot grasp what he does and, and, and we create a problem for ourselves because we find ourselves struggling trying to understand what he's doing. We, try and we find ourselves struggling trying to get insight and revelation as to how God is moving because he's moving in another realm and we, I can identify this facet of him because I haven't moved to the new light that he's rejecting from, projecting from. I uh, praise the name of our God. Give the Lord a praise. Clap your hands and tell him thank you. So as I begin to understand this, I realize uh, that we need to broaden our perspective of God, that we need to see God in a new light, that we need to see God in a new realm, and that we need to take the limits off God, and we need to get him out of the box that we put him in. Can I tell you, some of us have limited how God moves in our life because we put him in a box and we don't believe that he can do certain things and we don't believe that he can open certain doors and we don't believe that he can do things that are stupefying. And uh, the last time I checked, that God is the only being that's stupefying that to do things that can make you just stand there in awe 
of who he is and, and in awe of what he does. And I, I want to tell you that God is getting ready to do some super stupefying things that he's getting ready to blow some of our minds and how he moves and what he does. And we've got to move out the way and somebody say, let God be God. Amen. Somebody let God be God. Somebody let God do what God want to do. And I want to tell somebody, uh, my God, that's been trying to fix some stuff. That's been trying to work some stuff out. Uh, God, you need to throw your hands up and uh, say, God, any way you want to bless me, I'll be satisfied. You need to come to the place where you recognize and understand that God is the only one that can fix it. That God is the only one that can turn some things around. Oh, praise the name of our God. And, and I want to say this, that to our leaders, to our president, to the kings and to them that are in, in authority, even to the scientific world. We bless God for everything that they're doing. We bless God for everything that they're trying and for every, amen, trial that they're running and for every test that they're trying, amen, to put together. Ah, but God, I was reading in the book of Job the other day and I, I found out that man in his ignorance and his arrogance, ah, God sometimes bumps his head, amen, against a wall because... He doesn't realize uh, that some things are too high for him. If you ever read when God interrogates Job, he asks him, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth in the deep? Where were you when uh, the sons of God shouted for joy? Uh, where were you, amen, when I stretched out the heavens like a curtain? Hallelujah. Uh, what I recognize and realize is that some stuff is too hot for us to deal with. Uh, God, so even this coronavirus, we're going to come to understand that the only one that can bring the earth to silence is God. The only one that can shut the earth down and put everything on pause is God. How God? Somebody give him a praise right now. <clears throat> the only one, amen, that can stop, amen, everything from working everything from transpiring everything from being in motion is God as a matter of fact amen he even says in his word he said be silent and stand still because God has raised up from his holy habitation and uh, God some of us don't recognize and realize that God rules in the kingdom of men that he is sovereign he is supreme authority and that he has all power in his hands. Uh, God, we need to recognize and realize that the only thing we can do is fall on our knees and plead with him for his mercy, plead with him for his grace, and plead with him for his forgiveness. Hallelujah. Uh, God, because uh, the truth of the matter is and the reality of it is, uh, God, is that some of the things that we're dealing with uh, is the product of our own doing. Some of the things that we're dealing with is the product of our own creation. Uh, praise the name of our God. Uh, but let me move back to uh, uh, getting a deeper understanding of the other side of God. Because what I recognize is all of us have a theology. All of us have a train of thought when it comes down to God. And I want to, amen, even say this to the atheist. Even the atheist has said that there is no God, but that is a form of theology. That is his perspective of, of God's existence. Ah, but I want you to understand, the fool have said in his heart that there is no God. And you know what else I start to recognize? In troublesome times, you you don't find atheists in foxholes. Even people that don't believe are ready to pray right now because God is going to get the glory. So as I begin to understand something, let's go into a little bit of word so that we get a greater understanding uh, of the different side of God. Now, I said one of the first things that I said is that it's going to change how you think about God. And so I'm going to tell you this. You, you got God's word in front of you and God has spoken to us through his word and we need to take his word and what his word said. We need to understand that not a jot or a tittle of his word is going to fall to the ground before it comes to pass. That jot or that tittle is the smallest mark that a scribe can 
make, amen, in the word of God. And the smallest, amen, degree of God's word is going to be fulfilled. And I was talking with someone the other day, and, and as we were talking, they began to share with me, and they, they, they inquired of me, Amen. That I should pray. Amen. And, and that things would change and that things would be different. And as I begin to tell them, amen, that things may not be different or be, things may not change the way you want them to change, their whole countenance change, their whole attitude change, their whole perspective change because I begin to tell them that this potentially could be the beginning of sorrows. And I begin to tell them that if this is the beginning of sorrows, that means that something else potentially could be coming after this. And and they begin to cry out, oh no, and woe, and, and they begin to debate and, and, and to fuss. And, and I begin to tell them, hold on, you've got to understand that God's word will not come back to him void. If he said it, it's going to come to pass. Amen. If he sent his word, it's going to accomplish what he sent it to accomplish. So number one, uh, you got to get another perspective of God in that what God says he, he means. What God prophesied, it will come to pass. What God declares, can nobody disannul it, can nobody withstand it. Even the devil himself can stop God's word from coming to pass. It's going to water, it's going to bud, it's going to bring forth. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the name of our God. So as I begin to read, I I want to mess with your thinking. I want to mess with your thought process. Uh, and so we're going to look at Matthew chapter number 10. As we begin to look at Matthew chapter number 10, we're going to look at verse 34 through verse 36. And Jesus messes them up, uh, amen, because all of us have a concept of what we think Christ came to do. We think that he came to restore Israel, which he did. We think that he came, amen, to find the lost, which he did. And, 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 and we think that he came to share, uh, show us his love. And, 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 and we found out that no greater love has a man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. So he showed us all of those compassionate and virtual qualities, virtuous qualities that he possesses. Ah, oh my God. But uh, now he gets ready to mess with us how we think. So he says to us in Matthew chapter number 10, think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. That's the 34th verse. He said, think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. Uh, because we thought that he was a peacemaker, and he is, and we understand that the word says that blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. But you got to understand there's a difference between a peacekeeper and a peacemaker. Hallelujah. A peace uh, a keeper, amen, will only want to do everything nice and keep everybody level, but a peacemaker will start a war in order to bring peace. A peacemaker will set it off in order to bring you to another level. So I want you to understand something. He says, think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. I didn't come to bring peace. He says, but I come, amen, to, oh my God, what but a sword. And, and so what you got to understand is y'all thought that I was coming to bring peace. But I really come to bring a sword. Oh my God. That challenges our thinking. That causes us to look at him in another facet. That causes us to see him in another dimension. He says, For I am come to set a man at variance, at opposition against his father, and the daughter against her mother. Ah, God, and the daughter in law against her mother in law. Amen. And then he says, And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. So in other words, you thought that Jesus was coming to bring peace to your house. You thought that he was coming to bring, ah, my God, tranquility and serenity to your house. And there are going to be some rooms in your house that have tranquility and serenity. Ah, but then there's going to be others that are set at variance. There's going to be others that there's tension. And the tension is uh, out of the love of the truth. Ah, my God. You see, ah, my God, some people don't like us. 
And some people can't get along with us because we stand for the truth of God. The Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. Uh, my God, don't you understand that because of the truth, some people are going to become your enemy. Uh, but you can't drop your head and you, you, you cannot, amen, amen, go down in the dumps and be sorrowful because everybody don't like you. You got to understand and recognize, uh, my God, when all men speak well of you, that you may be coming up short according to what God wants you to do and according to God wants you to be. So now this is a challenge for you to see Christ in another light because he didn't come just to bring peace. He didn't come just to settle everything down. And, and, and somebody else need to understand that he did not come to destroy the law, but he came to fulfill it. He came to make everything right. He came to set it off. Y'all got to recognize, oh my God, <clears throat> that we use the word throw down. But amen, God says he was going to throw down in the word, in the book of Jeremiah. Can you understand that sometimes God has to shake things up. Sometimes God has to move in a different light. Sometimes God has to show himself in another realm in order for us to see him for who he really is. Ah, uh, God, so now, my thought process has to be changed. Now, how I view God has to be changed because when he starts moving in uh, the realm of judgment, when he starts moving in the realm, amen, uh, of passing out, amen, retribution, sometimes it's difficult for us to understand how a loving God could be so fierce, how a loving God could be so angry. Sometimes it's difficult for us to grasp how a loving God could pour out such indignation and such wrath, amen, that it shakes the entire world. I want you to understand because there is another side to God. Oh, somebody clap your hands and give our God a praise, the other side of God. So now, let us move and let us look at something a little bit further in the word of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And right now, hallelujah, we're going to go to Psalm. Chapter number seven, this gives us a different perspective of how God moves. Psalms chapter number seven, and I know, I know it's difficult, but I told you to put your seatbelt on. Psalms chapter seven, let's look at something. Because can I say this to you? God is holy before he is love. And sometimes we appeal to his love when we've abused his holiness. Think about that for a minute. We appeal to his mercy. We appeal to his grace. We appeal to his forgiveness. But we violated his righteousness. And you cannot continue to violate God's righteousness, violate the essence, the quintessential essence of who he is. Notice that God is holy before he is love. You cannot trample down on the holiness and then expect all the benefit and the blessing that come from being in relationship to God. And we have to be holy. Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. I don't care who you are. If you don't have holiness, you will not see him. And God, listen to this. God in his word asked us to be like him. He don't say, for I am love. Be ye love also. He says, be ye holy also. Why? Because I'm holy. I want you to understand something. God's love does not overweigh his outweigh his righteousness. And if you continue in your unrighteous acts, if you continue walking in unrighteous ways, then 
you leave God no choice but to execute judgment. And oh, I want to tell you, when God starts executing judgment, tears won't stop it from coming. You know, sometimes we think that we can play on the emotions of God. And if you get tired of stuff, what makes you think God don't? Sometimes we try to play on God's emotions and we cry. And you know, the Bible says, amen, that Esau sought repentance with tears. But he couldn't find it. Because it was too late. God had already moved. God had already passed out the blessing. And I want to tell somebody, don't you play around too long and you miss the move of God. Don't you play around too long, you miss what God is doing. Let's get to the word in Jesus' name. Psalms chapter number seven, the other side of God. In Psalms chapter number seven, we're going to look at verse 11 through 13. And it says this, that God judges the righteous. Think about that. We always talk about not judging. But contextually, if you don't have the proper criteria, you can't make the proper judgment. So when the Bible warns us, judge not that we be not judged, it is based upon our fairness. It says, for the same measure that you meet shall be meted unto you. And a lot of times, oh, we will slay and kill somebody else. But when it comes down to us, oh, we want grace to just play our violins. Hello? Hello? But there's coming a day when God's going to break the string of the violin. So God judges the righteous. And look at this. Look at this verse 11. And God is angry with the wicked every day. Notice this. He says God is angry with the wicked every day. When Jesus made that scourge of cords in the temple and Imagine that. Visualize that for a minute. Your Savior, your, your, your Savior, flipping tables out over, running people out of the sanctuary, throwing money over, and telling everybody, commanding them, get this stuff out of my house. That's why we got to be careful that we don't turn the sanctuary into a place of business. It ain't about selling books. It, it ain't about all of that all the time. Don't get me wrong. I'm writing a book right now. But it has to have its place. And that's why the man of God can't, can't get so off pace or off focus that he sees God's people as a, a means to his end. A ends to his means. You, you know what I'm saying. He only see you as a Range Rover payment. He only see you as a Mercedes opportunity instead of as a soul that needs to be ministered to. Hallelujah. So God is angry with the wicked when every day. God is angry, upset every day. And look at this. Let's, let's take it a little bit further. Let me, let, me, let me speed up a little bit. Let's go a little bit further. I'm relaxed. I feel good. I feel good. Amen. Amen. I'm just trying to minister what thus said the Lord. Look at this in verse 12. Talking about the wicked. If he turn not, he will wet his sword. Did y'all catch that? W-H-E-T. So if the wicked man don't turn, God has his sword prepared for him. It's the other side of God. It's the other side of God. And this is what you got to see. 
This is what you got to know. This is what you got to understand. Look what it says. He hath bent his bow mm -hmm, and made it ready. In other words, notice this. God is saying, I'm pulling back my bow. You don't pull out a gun unless you're ready to use it. God don't pull out his bow unless he's ready to use it. It says, 13, he have also prepared for him the instruments of death. Lord, have mercy. But I thought God was merciful. I thought God was gracious. I thought God was loving. He is. But if you get tired of dealing with stuff, what makes you think God don't? If you get tired of putting up with foolishness, what thinks you make? What makes you think that God don't? Hello, the other side of God, and I want to tell you that when God gets upset, when you've wearied His patience, when you've taken Him to His wit's end, baby, grace is over. When God gets upset, when God gets ready to pour out his wrath, when God gets ready to pour out his judgment, when he gets ready to set things in order, you just got to step back and be quiet and pray that he'll have mercy. Hallelujah. Let's move. We're going to go a little bit further in Jesus' name. And so you got to recognize, we, and, and especially those of us who call ourselves born-again believers, those of us who call ourselves Christians, those of us who carry the bloodstained banner. We are the ones that are responsible to make sure that people have a proper perspective of who God really is. Sometimes it's the preacher's fault. Sometimes it's the Sunday school teacher's fault. Sometimes, amen, it's your grandmama's fault because they only taught you about the love of God and they didn't teach you about the wrath of God. Sometimes... It's our leaders and our teachers, amen, who have come up short in giving us the whole perspective of who God really is. I want y'all to understand something. Can I tell you this? I'm getting ready to say something that's, that's pretty heavy. It's realistic. Uh, we know that Jesus is gentle and he's soft and he's often times portrayed as the lamb. But can I tell you this, that the lamb has lion's blood. Oh my God, I wish somebody had catch that. Can I tell you that the lamb has lion's blood. There is sometimes where the lamb transforms and he changes, amen, from a lamb into a lion. There is sometimes, amen, that he turns from being that gentle shepherd, amen, to being the executioner. There is sometimes where God goes into the changing room and he switches and turns and shows you another facet of who he is. And even though you cannot see his love, even in the middle of a man executing judgment, he still has love. Hallelujah. Let's move. Let's deal with the people of God. First Peter chapter four, real quick. Other side of God. You got to get this. You got to get this. You got to get this. Amen. And I say this because this is something that's been in my heart for years. Hallelujah. And the Lord never released me to minister it, but I got to minister it now. I got to minister it now because too many of us think of God in a box. Uh, let me say something to, the, to you. Thinking of God in a box is dangerous because it means that uh, you're myopic, you're short-sighted. You can't see God in, 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 in the fullness of who he is. And then uh, I, I thought about this uh, you have a cycloptic perspective of who God is. You say cycloptic. Cyclops is a man, a, a, a mystical being. Uh, you know, he's a big being, got one eye, he can only see. Amen. And then uh, for, the, for you kids, you know the minions, you know them little minions. You know, one of them has one eye. But what's bad about having one eye or one perspective is that it limits you and seeing the full truth. It limits you from understanding the full degree of who God is and how God's functions. And so when you develop a cycloptic theology in relationship to God, when God moves in a different manner or a manner that's beyond what you're accustomed to, you find yourself challenging or you find yourself struggling within your own mind. Amen? But now 
It's time to let your mind be renewed by the washing of the water of the word. Amen. It's time to let God renew your mind. Amen. Amen. And transform you into the being that God wants you to be. Hallelujah. So let's move. Let's go to Peter. First Peter chapter number four. Amen. First Peter chapter number four. And let's look at verse number 17. This gives us clear indication that it's up to us to get things right. And right now, it's time to set your house in order. It's time to make sure that you're where you need to be at. It's time to do spring cleaning. It's time to get rid of the mess of junk. It's time to clean it out. Don't you know? A clean oven cooks better than a dirty one. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 4, verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. You've heard this. You've read this. A lot of us don't like to deal with it. Sometimes when things are out of order, God comes to his house first to straighten it out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And if it first began at us, listen to what he's saying. If it first starts with us, what shall the end of the be of them that obey not the gospel of God? In other words, if he's going to judge us first and be hard on us, what's going to happen to the people that ain't trying to do right? Oh, my God. They're going to have to deal with God, and it ain't going to be good. Hallelujah. It ain't going to be good. You said, Pastor, well, you're supposed to be encouraging me. I'm encouraging you, amen, to get the right perspective of who God is so you can live in the proper place and don't fool yourself. And guess what? As a tree fall, that's where it's going to lie at. People can't live any kind of way. And then when they pass, we, we put them all in heaven. Truth of the matter, everybody ain't going to heaven. Some folks are going to hell. Oh, pastor, don't say that. This is the other side of God. God showed you about hell. He told you about hell. He told you it was real. Now you want to deny it. There's another side to it. Look at this. Verse 18, and if the righteous scarcely be saved, what shall the sinner and the ungodly appear? Now, can I tell you something? If God's people have to pray and cry and fast and moan and go through all of the things <clears throat> that we have to go through in order for us to make it, do you think that God going to let fast-talking Willie just slide his way into heaven and he ain't trying to do the right thing? Do you think that God is, is going to let Michelle, who got a bunch of lovers, just do her thing and just because she pray, it's going to be all right? No, 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 no. I want to tell you that there's another side to God. And so <clears throat> as we begin to look and we begin to go further, as we begin, amen, to look at these things, I'm reminded, amen, of the book of Ezekiel, amen, chapter number nine. Read it in its entirety in your own time. But the book of Ezekiel validates what Peter just said. In Ezekiel's vision, amen, the Lord shows Ezekiel Jerusalem and Judah. And because Judah and, amen, Jerusalem has sinned and they've, they've come up short and, and they've lived a lewd life and they've done all these kind of things. God gets ready to pass judgment, amen, on those cities. He gets ready to pass judgment on those places. And so, oh my God, uh, as Ezekiel's vision begins to unfold, <clears throat> Ezekiel sees, amen, the city and then, amen, God speaks, amen, to six men. And uh, these six men come forth in Ezekiel chapter number nine. And these six men, amen, have a key.
healing device in their hand. They got a sword in their hand. And, and as they begin to come forth and approach the city, there's one in the middle of them and he has on linen. And the Bible says that he has an a ink horn, amen, on his side. In other words, he has a writing instrument on his side. And, and as they begin to approach the city, amen, God whispers and tells the one with the ink horn to go forth. And he says, and to mark my servants in their forehead and to mark them, amen, with my mark. And then he tells the six men that have their killing devices, he says, go after him, amen, that has the ink horn. And he says, I want you to slay everybody. He says, don't have pity. He says, don't have mercy. He says, slay children, slay women, slay young, slay old. He says, slay all of them. He says, but on my servants, whose mark is in their forehead, he says, do not touch. Ah, my God, that's the other side of God. But can I tell you this? The reason I brought that out is because God is passing out judgment but in the middle of judgment he's making provision for his people in the middle of judgment he covers his people amen in the middle of judgment he puts his mark upon them so that they don't go down with the rest of the world I want to tell somebody that you got to know and understand that there is another dimension to God there's the other side of God and as I said I go right now the lion is coming out and not the lamb right now in Jesus name our righteousness amen is being mandated by God he no longer wants to put up with how we live and what we do and we call right amen wrong and we call wrong right and we call up down and down up and we oh God I know you don't want to hear it and we call girls men and we call men girls and hey God hallelujah and God amen bringing us back to the place of his word ah my God you got to understand I, even though you don't like it it don't feel good amen I ain't trying to make you feel good. I'm trying to get you good. I'm trying to get you to the place where you're in the proper relationship with God. There is another side to God and that other side is wrath. And can I tell you this? When God begins to pour out his wrath, when God begins to pour out his judgment, hallelujah, you can't stop his judgment if you don't like it. You can't stop his judgment, hallelujah, if you don't want to line up with it. It don't matter whether or not you want to line up with it. He is the judge, amen, he is the bailiff, hey my God, y'all ain't saying nothing. He is the warden of the prison, hallelujah, and they all work in conjunction one with the other because you're dealing with the other side of God. I want to say this to you. God is only chastening you to try to get you in alignment. Let me say this real quick. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm just being a good pastor. I'm telling you the truth of God's word. You got to develop a, a full perspective of who God is. Hebrews chapter 12. I ain't got time to go through all of it, but I want to pull one verse, verse 11. Hebrews 12 and 11 simply says this. Now, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous. But grievous is difficult. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So what I want you to understand, what I want you to understand is this. Too many of us have adopted this new philosophy that we're not going to correct our children. We're not going to chasten them. The Bible says this, that if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. I'm going to share this with you. 
children that have been spared the rod grow up to be spoiled adults. And I want to tell you something. If you won't correct your child, you don't really love him. Not in the proper perspective. Because a child needs to understand that you love him enough to correct him. This is what is housed here. I ain't got time to read all of it. You read it in your own time. Amen. You make sure you go back and read Hebrews chapter 11. Amen. And, and you start at verse 6. And come on up to 11. So what I want you to understand is this. The reason God spanks you, and Job even says, therefore despise not the chastisement of the Almighty. God is trying to work something in you so that later you don't have to be in trouble. And so he says this, that no chastening, it don't feel good, I don't like it. One of the things that I found out when I became a man is I developed an appreciation for the whoopings that my mom gave me. And what I recognize is that when I thought she hated me, she really showed me love because she was willing to chasten me so that I might learn how to do the right thing. You know what happened? When I got tired of getting spankings and whoopings, I started doing right. So I didn't have to get any more spankings. So what am I saying to you now? God may be chastening you. He may be spanking you. He may be getting you in alignment. But he's trying to teach you a principle. Once you learn the principle, the whooping cease. So let me close with this. Hebrews chapter 12. One verse. One verse. Excuse me, I said Hebrews chapter 12. I meant Hebrews chapter 10. One verse. Verse 31. The reason I'm saying this, the reason I'm ministering to you this message, because if you don't change your perspective, of who God is and you don't change how you relate to God you might end up dealing with the other side of God and the other side of God's love is his anger the other side of God's love is his wrath the other side of God's love is his judgment so I'm going to leave you with the scripture Hebrews chapter 10 31st verse it says it is a fearful thing <clears throat> to fall into the hands of the living God it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God I pray that this is blessed someone I pray that it has encouraged someone. I pray that someone will develop a panoramic perspective of who God is. The reality, God is not one faceted. He's multifaceted. And if he's multifaceted, I have to be able to see him from the angle that the light shines off of that facet. That's what makes a diamond so wonderful. Most of the time when women have on a diamond, they they move it, they move it, and each time they move it, it gives them a different refraction. I want to pray with you today. I want to pray that the, 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 the parameters of your mind would be enlarged. 
that you would begin to see God in a much broader light, that you would begin to understand him for who he is and what he does. And even now, even now, when God is doing something that a lot of us have a hard time grasping, those of us who know him, we have peace because we know he's in control. Those of us who know him were settled in our spirit because we understand that he's fulfilling his word. It'll stop when God says it's over. It'll change when God says it's finished. Stand up with me. Come on. Come on. Stand up with me. Bow your head. Bow your head. Hallelujah. If you're with someone, hold their hand. We're going to pray. We're going to believe God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you today. We love you today. We praise you. We adore you. And we magnify you. God, as we come before you today, we thank you for loving us so much that you'll give us insight into the different facets of your character. We won't be myopic anymore, Lord. We won't only see you in one way. We'll understand that what you say in your word that you mean. So Father, now, bless those that are hearing me. Bless those, oh God, that are stretching out their hands, that are bowing their heads. Move the box off their head that they can see you in the light in which you really dwell. Do it today. Someone that may be repenting and someone that may be Contrite in their spirit and in their heart. Draw them to you with loving kindness and with tender mercies. And let them know that you wash them, that you forgive them, that you move their sins out the way. We love you today, God. We thank you today. We praise you. And we do bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord praise if you pray with me in Jesus' name. We thank the Lord for you. And so in Jesus' name, we bless the Lord. Amen. We pray that that word, the other side of God has blessed you. At this time, if you'd like to be a blessing to the house of the Lord in Jesus' name, if you'd like to be a blessing and to help last day's church ministry continue, so a seed with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can go, amen, that's being put on the screen. You can go to our website, uh, which is www.lastdayschurch.org. Uh, you can check it out there. If you want to give, you can uh, go on to Givelify and download the application, and you'll be able to sow a seed uh, into our ministry in Jesus' name. I want to tell you, you're sowing in good ground. This ground got miracle grow in it. Amen? This ground is very good ground in Jesus' name. So we just believe in God. Sow a seed. Be a blessing to the house of the Lord if we've been a blessing to you in Jesus' name. As always, myself and First Lady, we certainly miss you guys. We certainly uh, love you guys. We're praying for you in Jesus' name, praying, amen, that God will give you a broader perspective, praying that you'll have endurance in Jesus' name and that you'll be able to come out of this with more joy than you went in with. So we thank the Lord for you. We love you. God bless you. Heaven smile upon you in Jesus' name.